We are in Baden-Badenau um, for the Ford. We saw the first win of Vincent Keimer against uh, Georg Meyer and four draws. Well, let's start with the draws, perhaps. Um, Anand Caruana, what can you tell us about that game? Not much, to be honest. That was a bit of a quiet before the rest day type of game. But of course, it's tough for Vichy as well. He's white, he plays 1e4, and he doesn't know if Garona will play the Petrov, the Sveshnikov, which he's been playing here. And that game, he chose the Berlin, which I would guess came as a bit of a surprise. And Vichy chose a solid line, this rookie one, which leads to quiet positions. Had a novelty somewhere more around move 14, queen d1, but it only, quote unquote, required Karana to find a couple of precise moves to completely equalize, and Karana did so. Typical Grandmaster draw, well prepared by Black. And another typical Grandmaster draw, much Fajela Graf against Aronian. What do you think? Yeah, that's a line they've been playing against each other for a while now. It's this Marshall, which is Aronian's main defense against the Rui Lopez. And MVL likes to play this 8A4 line. But Levon is so experienced in these positions, he keeps coming up with new strategic plans in this game. He pushed his D-pawn to D5 and then D4 very early on, which is not a typical plan in these structures. But over the board, Maxim could not find a way to pose problems, so the game ended in a move repetition somewhere around move 25. Not much to see there either. But some more to see in the game Switler against uh, Vallejo, mainly because Vallejo played so kind of a bit of a risky, I think. What do you think? Yeah, that was a bit surprising to me because Switler played the Italian, the Gioco Piano, which normally leads to quiet positions. But Vallejo with black played h6 and g5, which is a very, very risky concept that normally you would play to play for a win against a lower rated opponent. But I thought it might backfire. But Paco explained later that, okay, he was on minus two and he felt like getting a fighting game and he said, okay, let's make it minus one or minus three. He didn't succeed, the game ended in a draw. I think they both played well. It was very complicated, but they both navigated the complications very well. So it had a small advantage, but never enough to increase it and get a win. So well fought draw by both of them. Another well fought draw, Carlsen against Neidic. There's always fireworks here in Baden-Baden or in Karlsruhe between those two. This game again was quite exciting, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure of exciting. There is a lot of history between them. We know that Neidic once, once, once won two games in a row against Magnus Carlsen in 2014, 2015. So Carlsen certainly respects him. It was in a way a typical Carlsen game, a slightly offbeat structure, but very complex strategically out of some quiet English opening, where I think both sides had isolated deep pawns, which is not something you see very often, four pawns on the d-file. And I can't really put my finger on any critical moments. I think it was a well-played game once again, where Magnus was doing his thing, playing a long game, trying to put pressure, where Akadi hung in there and played some very strong defensive or counter-attacking moves. Even in the end, in some rook ending, Black still had to be a bit precise, where Akadi just played very well and held Magnus to a draw. Okay, and the last game was Keimer against Maya, the first win for Vincent Keimer in a Super Tournament. Before we go to the position, what can we tell about that game? Yeah, Keimer, as usual, extremely well prepared against a bit of an offbeat line by Georg Meyer. This Vienna D takes C4, E4, B5 is not the most common of lines, but Keimer knew what he was doing, and I think something went wrong for Georg in the opening. Maybe this H6 move was bad. And Keimer built a very big advantage. Then he kept playing well, increased the advantage, but he let Meyer sort of escape into an endgame. There was one point where he played in the middle game, queen f5 check and queen d7, allowing c5 in the exchange of queens. Well, if he had, had, if he had kept the queens, move like b4 or a4, white's position looked very strong. Anyway, in that endgame, it seemed like Meyer should make a draw, but then he missed something around the time control and Keimer had a winning pawn ending all of a sudden. But that winning pawn ending was by no means as easy as we thought during the live commentary. We thought, okay, White gets an extra queen and the game will be over soon. But it was full of tricks and actually there were still ways for Meyer to hold. So I'm not quite sure if it actually was winning, I should correct myself. But he did get a winning position, which we will look at now. So we enter the advanced stage of this pawn ending here where White already has an extra queen. He queened his eight pawn on a8 and now centralized the queen. But surprisingly, the game is still not over. Black has this G passer and Black has one hidden resource that Keimer had to spot. Keimer somewhere around here. He spent a lot of time calculating and to his credit calculated a very, very long forcing sequence. 
which we'll now look at. White has to stop the g pawn, so he starts with queen back to e1. Good move. And frankly, it looks like black has to resign. If you retreat the, queen, the king, the queen goes to g1, and it's just game over. And if the king advances, you take this pawn. But black has one very cute trick here, which Meyer, of course, spots. He plays the move c5 to c4. And the point is, if you take this pawn, which looks very natural, then black queens his own pawn, g1 queen, and if white takes, it is stalemate. So this is a very surprising stalemate trick that I had not seen in this very version before. Um, but of course Vincent by now had anticipated this, so he met c4 with the move b4. You have to keep this pawn alive for now, so there's no stalemate after g1. But it's far from over, because black still has the idea of getting rid of this pawn and then doing the same thing, once again leading to stalemate. So Kaima had to calculate a very long sequence here, which he did. He played king to c6, pawn to c2, and now another key moment. If you were to play, let's say, pawn to b5, then the same mechanism still works. Black gets a queen, white takes, black gets another queen, white takes, and it's stalemate. So white has to block this pawn, queen to c1, which Kaima found. And that's not easy to anticipate, at least for me, that this is winning. Here, the game is still not over, because black has counterplay after king h2, and queen takes c2, and king back to h3. This looks counterintuitive, but it's still the same idea. If the white queen tries to stop the pawn, once again, it's stalemate. So, Keimer has to find a way not to allow that stalemate and to stop the black pawns. First, I think he came a bit closer with the queen. <clears throat> Is this it? Sorry, I have to cheat. Queen e2, yeah. King h3, queen e3, king h2, queen to f2. Now king h3 no longer works because now the queen has access to this square. Once the queen blocks this pawn, it's over. So Maya has to try h3, run with this pawn and try to get a queen himself. But Keimer had calculated all of this very far ahead when we were talking about this position. Queen e1, he had seen the whole sequence, which yeah, I found impressive. King to h1, queen to g3. Now the point is, if black gets a queen, then white just takes this pawn, then exchanges queens, and queens is b-pawn. So you come to that. The only hope is pawn to h2. And the precise moves continue. Queen f3, not allowing this pawn to queen. King to g1. Now this guy wants to queen. Queen e3 check. King to f1. Kama brings his queen to f4, for a reason that we will see in a minute. Queen f4 check. King back to g1. And here we get the final position of Kaima's calculation. Now he goes b6, allowing black to queen a pawn. The first side looks equal. Both sides have a queen and a passer that's about to go through. But the point is that after pawn to b7, there is nothing that black can do stopping this pawn from queening. And we see how important it was to get the queen to f4. Because it controls this square, so b8 queen can't be prevented. And it also controls the h6 square from where the black queen could give a check. So this is game over, and you had to see this position very, very far in advance when he played this queen e1, which he did. And a few moves later, Kaima would get the second queen, and Maya had to resign. So very impressive finish there by Vincent Kaima, earning him his first win in the tournament. Okay, thank you very much for this explanation of this fascinating endgame. Let's see how Vincent... Uh place today and the rest of the games in baden baden Just a short recap of our four, five first rounds in Karlsruhe. Um, good tournament, the quality of the games quite uh, impressive. Long games by Carlsen. What is the most striking thing you noticed this week in Karlsruhe? Yeah, that about sums it up. I think results-wise we don't have any giant surprises. The stronger players, this is a mixed field where <clears throat> half the field outrates the other half significantly. And there on the lead, Magnus, I think, would prefer having more points after he started with two out of two. And he's been working incredibly hard, as you mentioned, six and a half hour games regularly. But he ran into some good defense and could not score another win. He'll be eager to grab back the sole lead because Vichy Anand is hanging in right there. I think as you could argue a slightly easier schedule the rest of the tournament. And then guys like Fabiano Caruana are still very much lurking. So nothing's decided on the bottom of the ranking. Keimer and Meyer both have one of five, and Vallejo has one and a half out of five, so these guys, of course, will try to avoid finishing last, but they will be facing a lot of tough opponents, so I think we'll see more exciting struggles with big rating differences even today in the sixth round here in Baden-Baden. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.